Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. Now in today's video we will be putting ourselves in the shoes of a security researcher and we will be trying to find a vulnerability in voice over IP monitor software. Now the goal here is to trace the footsteps and to look at how you can find your own vulnerability and get your own CVE. The vulnerability that we will be looking at today was found by an independent security researcher and it was reported to SSD Secure Disclosure and I'm happy to announce that they are the sponsor of today's video. Now SSD Secure Disclosure, they have the experience, the tools and the resources to quickly and responsibly disclose vulnerabilities to organizations and compensate you for it. They are mainly interested in operating systems, browsers, CMSs, but in reality they handle most major software and hardware and their scope changes weekly. So if you find a critical vulnerability and you want to disclose it, contact SSD Secure Disclosure for more info. On top of that, head over to their website, link down below in the description. And if you want any more information on and updates on anything cybersecurity related, head over to their Twitter and YouTube, uh, which are also linked in the description down below. Enjoy the video. Let's talk about voice over IP monitor, why it is a great target to pick and how we can attempt to enumerate this target and find vulnerabilities in it. So first of all, voice over IP monitor is a software that allows for the monitoring of uh, voice over IP calls by monitoring the network and how the network is performing and it has a lot of customers, a lot of call centers, a lot of large customers. It is also a very old product, so its development started in 2012 or that's when the first releases came out. Um, and it has always been expanded upon. So these are, so first of all we have a lot of uh, customers, we have a popular product that has been expanded upon for a long time. Now these are some key um, key points when you're picking your target. If your target has had a long development time, a long lifetime, then that might mean that obviously the developers that are developing that are developing it now weren't developers back then. And a lot of features have been added, and some things may have been missed. So that's a great place to start. And obviously, when starting it. You don't know anything about the application so you'll have to look at it set it up yourself and you will see that it is uh, using php um, to do everything so let's take a look at for example the index.php file and how we can use that to attempt uh, to find vulnerabilities so first of all what are we going to do we're going to look over this file but we can't just look over it, it is uh, over 10,000 lines long, so that would not, that would, would be useless. What are we looking for here? Well, when looking at PHP and when trying to find vulnerabilities in PHP code, there are a lot of very dangerous functions to take into account. And there's lists of them on GitHub that you can use, that you can look at uh, functions such as system, uh, exec, uh, require ones, but, but even more functions that you didn't think would be uh, unsafe. And these functions are not unsafe in every case. However, they are dangerous to use because if you get the implementation wrong, um, they will be exploitable. So my goal when looking at uh, this white code, uh, white box analysis here where we can see the actual source code is to look for these dangerous functions and then trace the user data back to, okay, this dangerous function takes in an, an argument that comes from here. Can I somehow get my user data in there? And that's exactly what we can start to do. So let's start up, start with this index file and let's start from the top. And the first function we see here is a require once. Uh, require once is a dangerous function because it will uh, take in a file and it will open it and run it as PHP. In this case, we are taking PHP slash lib slash functions underscore brand dot PHP and we're running that file, that PHP file. Now, why is this dangerous? Well, if I can inject user input into that file uh, parameter, then I could potentially execute uh, any PHP file on the file system that I want, which is dangerous. Now, in this case, the argument is a string that I cannot modify. So in that regard, it is not dangerous. However, if I were to start looking at um, further into this application and I would find a file upload vo uh, functionality, and I could use that to upload files, files to anywhere, it is really good to take into account that, hey, if I can write to that file, then I might be able to have remote code execution. 
So keeping that in mind, but continuing, uh, we have a couple of more require ones and then some uh, definitions and things that aren't really interesting to us at the moment. We have some logout uh, functionality. And then we come here to a configuration functionality. And this is obviously interesting. Configuration is always interesting. It's going to check if the config slash configuration.php file exists. I'm looking at my own file system and my installation, default installation of this product. I see that it is present. Um, it's then going to check if a recheck post parameter is set. And we can set that so we can say yes, it is set. Then it's going to look at a spool directory uh, post parameter and say if it's not empty, then I'm going to set the configuration type value uh, for spool there to this value that uh, the user has inputted in the post request. Now this already starts to um, raise some concerns. So this set configuration type value, is it going to change that config slash configuration.php file? Um, so that's something that you definitely need to look into. But continuing to the next line, it says include once and then our configuration file. So now um, you really need to look into this further because if that set configuration type value uh, function is going to write to that configuration file and doesn't properly sanitize the user input, then we may have an RCE on our hands. So let's look into that. I'm going to go to definition on that function and look at it. So it takes in a type and a value as uh, arguments, as parameters. And the first thing it does is it reads the contents and gets the contents of the config slash configuration.php file. So, okay, ding, ding, ding. We expected that and that is actually the case. So it's going to read that file. Now, the most important thing is, is it also going to write to that file in this function? And scrolling down, the very last line, it says file put contents into that file some new contents. So, okay, it's also going to write to that file. Okay, what does this file look like? What are, what is this, what does this contain? Um, let's take a look at that. So, if I open a configuration.php file, we will see that this contains a whole lot of definitions of various different uh, settings, I suppose, conf obviously configurations. Now, going back to our index.php file, uh, let's see what happens with our input. So, it's going to all the content is going to be get gotten from that configuration file. We are then going to do an explode. So it's going to um, take every line, put that in an array. And then we're also creating a content new uh, array. Okay. Now here, if a string value, this is the first use of our value. And here it's going to say, if that's a string, we're going to change it and we're going to wrap it in quotes in double quotes. Okay. Then we're creating this variable new type value. And here it's going to create this string. That starts with define, just like we saw in the configuration file. It then wraps the type in quotes and places the value uh, behind a comma after it. So this is going to be a string that contains pretty much every line that we see in the configuration file. Interesting. Now we are going to loop over all of the lines in our configuration file. And we're going to say if our type is present in there, then we're going to do something. If our type is present in there and the current content is different from the one that from the value that we supplied, then we are going to write that define line, uh, or we're going to put that in the array in the new content array. So that's very interesting, because at the end there, we saw that we are putting the contents back into that file. So what I'm assuming is happening here is we're reading that file, we're changing the value uh, that we supplied the type and the value. And then we are saving the file and then later it's being included. Now, I, I didn't see any input sanitation anywhere of my value here. What is happening with that? Could I just input anything? Well, let's try it out. So for trying it out, I'm going to write a curl request. Um, and let's see what it has to be, uh, what it has to have. So going all the way back up to our, um, to our beginning here, we have our is set recheck. Okay, so in our curl request, uh, we're going to have to do a curl. And we're going to say, okay, with dash D, recheck equals um, a value. So recheck is set. Going back to our code, we also have to set the spool there directory. And this will contain our payload eventually. So in this case, I will just set that to anything. When I send that request, I can go look at my local files here and I can go look at the configuration. And this configuration now contains 
define, spool directory, anything. As expected, we can change that value. Now, however, we can change that value to literally anything. What if we change it to a double quote followed by a uh, closing bracket and a semicolon? So now we've closed this define here. And what if we now start a new command by saying, okay, system open double quote ID. Now the end double quote and the uh, end parentheses will follow uh, just by default. So now we have a payload here that starts with a double quote and ends with our ID here. Let's see if we can actually input that and get code execution. So if we do that, if we paste that in and we run, we see that at the top, we get back the user ID equals 33, which is www data, uh, the group ID equals 33 and so on. So our ID command actually got executed and we even see um, the data back from it. So that, that's incredible. Let's try a different command. Let's do a, an LS for example. And when we run that, we see that we get a whole lot of files and that is the actual uh, file system here. So we have remote code execution. We have, we were able to find that out by just reading through the code. And that is incredible. Now, a couple of things to note here, um, with all of these vulnerabilities, finding a CVE can look very daunting. It can look incredibly difficult and it is, it is not easy. However, once you've identified a good target and once you go into this target and really start looking through it and understand the code base, it will become humanly possible. It won't be uh, some sort of black magic. And I think that's very important to motivate you to actually go and hunt for these. Now, that was it for today's video. As always, if you have any questions, leave them, leave them down below in the comments and I would like to see you back for another video. Thank you.